Hey, it's Jason Rogers here. And in this video, I wanna to talk to you about one of the most important business principles I've learned probably in my life here before. Something I candidly stumbled into to a degree and got lucky with. It's the principle of competitive advantage. And in this video in particular, we're gonna be talking about probably the most dominant grocery store in the United States of America when you look at their local dominance and the profitability of this grocery store. It's the HEB grocery chain. HEB Grocery is the most profitable grocery store chain in America, according to Bruce Greenwald, the University of Columbia business school professor who studies competitive advantage all day long. Before you dismiss Bruce as some professor that doesn't know anything about business, here's a couple of words that Warren Buffett had to say. Hi, Bruce. I have run into literally dozens of people who attribute their success in investing uh, to the class they uh, took with you. In fact, one of the two uh, investment managers I've chosen at, uh, at uh, Berkshire uh, got a huge uh, impetus to their education. When he took your class, uh, uh, Todd Combs, and uh, uh, I, just, I just have met dozens and dozens and dozens of people who, who uh, said it was the best class they ever took. Warren Buffett is clearly giving Bruce tons of credit for his teachings and his insight into investment. And Bruce is the one that has made the HEB case study one of the foundational studies that he teaches in his classes. And so it really begs the question, what is going on with HEB Grocery? Let's dive into this and really explore so that you can better allocate capital and make better acquisitions and better investments in everything that you do in your financial life. HEB Grocery Stores literally focuses on just a part of one of the 50 states in the United States of America, yet they do billions of dollars a year in revenue. HEB Grocery Stores has dominated the San Antonio and the Austin, Texas marketplaces. Check out this image right here, which shows how singularly focused their operations are and how targeted their area of focus is. You don't see them expanded all over the United States. Heck, you don't even see them expanded all over Texas. You see them literally focused in just two core metropolitans and those surrounding areas. And this idea of competitive advantage is something that Warren Buffett has been talking about for decades and decades and decades. Of course, I'm sure you're familiar with Warren Buffett, arguably the most successful value investor in the history of investing. And the story of HEB and their local dominance really illustrates the power of competitive advantage. And competitive advantage, just to give some context, I would define is essentially having a line of defense that keeps competitors from taking your market share. Right? What are the moats? I made a video recently about moats. Basically, you know, from the medieval times, moats surrounded castles and moats kept the bad guys out of the castle, right? What economic moats does a business have that keeps com competitors from coming in and taking your market share? And when it comes to the example of HEB grocery stores, they have a ton of moats that keep them as the dominant force in that local market so that they can do billions and billions of dollars a year in revenue. For example, the fact that all of their locations are so centrally located means they can easily keep a close eye on their operations. It means they can swap managers in and out easily from one store to another. They can swap out C-level executives easily to oversee this local market versus that local market because again, the drive from San Antonio to Austin, Texas, it's a short drive away. Likewise, this gives them a ton of purchasing power where they can buy things in massive bulk, massive, massive bulk in a way that a local mom and pop grocer simply cannot. And so what does that mean? It means they're able to buy, I'm sure, milk or produce or meats or eggs at a, a volume that their local competition simply cannot. And what does that mean, of course? It translates to them being able to still make a profit while selling their products, their eggs, their milk, their produce, their what have you, their bread at lower prices because they're buying in bulk. 
there are so many advantages that come when you dominate a local marketplace. And I was saying at the beginning of the video, this is something I didn't really recognize. Just a year, year and a half ago, I was living in Southern California and I decided I wanted to buy a manufactured housing community. And next thing you know, I'm out in Kansas and Nebraska and South Dakota looking at acquisition targets because I found that the California real estate prices were too high. They were overinflated. Things worked out. We actually found a great piece of property, 38 unit property that has a real local moat that allows us to be the dominant player in our local marketplace. And now having studied the great investors of history, I'm realizing how important it is to dominate that local marketplace. So as before I was looking, okay, maybe we'll buy one in Nebraska and then maybe I'll buy a park in North Dakota, or maybe then I'll buy a park in Illinois, or maybe then I'll buy a park in Georgia. Now I'm thinking what manufactured housing communities or what parks can I buy that are within a 25 to 50 mile radius of our existing property? To get back to HEB for a second, when other grocery store chains have tried to enter that market, they've almost all failed. I think the only two grocers that are really in the San Antonio and Austin markets for my study have been Whole Foods and Trader Joe's, but them combined have a way smaller market share in that Austin, Texas and San Antonio, Texas region than does HEB. Because what all these other grocers struggle to do when they enter those local marketplaces is compete. And HEB has so much purchasing power, so much buying power, so much local leverage, and so much brand equity in those local markets that the local consumers just A, feel more comfortable with HEB than any other grocer, and B, if a new grocer tries to enter the marketplace, then HEB can just cut their prices so low, they can operate at such a low profit margin that that new competitor is going to basically just die. There's no margin. There's no meat on the bone. But when you have hundreds of locations in a local area, you can drop that profit margin to maybe 1%. But still, because you have so many locations, you're still turning a profit. Whereas that new guy that came in that only has one or two or three grocery stores, he's going to get eaten alive in that kind of a marketplace. This is the power of dominating your own backyard before you try to expand into national markets. And I'll give you another example that really ties into this point. If you've ever read Sam Walton's book, his biography that chronicles the growth of Walmart, you'll realize in reading that book that for years and years and years, Sam initially focused almost exclusively on, I believe, first the Arkansas marketplace. And then I believed he moved up to Missouri. And only after many years of mastering his craft, mastering his operations on a local level, only once he dominated his backyard, did he then expand nationally. And even still, he had challenges when he expanded nationally. Target, you've all heard of Target. They gave him some trouble when he entered marketplaces in new markets where Target already had a strong foothold. It took, a, it took Walmart many, many, many years to expand into Canada and Mexico. And actually when Walmart tried to expand into Europe, they really struggled. They never were able to build a strong presence in Europe. And I, I can hypothesize that one of, the, one of the many reasons why is because there's different consumer demand in Europe. There were different, different dominant forces that already had supply chains and already had vendor relationships and already had strong management in place and already had brand equity and already had the confidence of local lenders as well. That's another benefit of staying in your own backyard is once you dominate your own backyard, you know the lenders in the local area, you know the brokers in the local area so that if a grocery store, for example, goes on sale, for the example of HEB, they're quickly gonna be able to, to know that they can buy out that, that mom and pop that's finally looking to sell and perhaps turn that mom and pop grocery store into an HEB, right? So these are the kinds of advantages you have when you dominate your own local market. And as the University of Columbia business professor who teaches competitive advantage has said many times over, almost every single company that has grown to be a massive dominant force started by dominating their local market. A few exceptions include companies like Microsoft and Facebook that take advantage of the cloud and that take advantage of scaling via internet-based systems. But if you're a service provider or if you're a company that provides local consumers, a product or a service, then before you try to dominate the world, the data of all the successful companies suggests that your odds of success go way higher if you focus on dominating your own backyard first before you try to take over the world. One of my business advisors said something interesting to me the other day. He said, you know, Jason, 
if I had a chance to either have $20 million of revenue in the Tampa Bay, Florida market or $30 million of revenue nationally, I would take the Tampa 20 over the national 30 any day of the week. And that really left an impression on me because it's counterintuitive. You think, well, why wouldn't I want more revenue? But of course, the underlying premise is that that $20 million in revenue in the Tampa Bay area, you can quickly grow to be a greater amount of revenue and you can do so more profitably. That's the elephant in the room as well. Just because you have $30 million of revenue doesn't mean you're necessarily turning a nickel of profit. There are companies that have a ton of revenue that turn virtually no profit. Why? Because they're overstretched. The idea of fighting a two front war, the Germans learned this the hard way when they chase the Russians deep into Russia as winter approached while simultaneously fighting the European front. And if you study history, you know what happened. The Germans got burned by trying to fight a two front war simultaneously. They lost a ton of lives when winter fell in Russia and simultaneously because a lot of the resources were extended into Russia, they were not as strong on their European front. And one could argue that that was in part what led to their demise. It's easier to win a single war than it is to win multiple wars simultaneously. It's easier to dominate your own backyard first and turn a great profit there and build the systems and the procedures and the management and the culture in your own backyard than it is to try to scale that culture, scale those operations and scale profitability across an entire country like the United States, which spans thousands and thousands of miles. So for you, if you're an acquisitions entrepreneur that's thinking about buying businesses, if you're even an investor that's looking to buy equities on the stock market, I would really implore you to study the company or the companies that you're analyzing and really get a sense of how dominant are they in their own backyard. And what is their competitive advantage? Watch the video I made about moats, which is really an extension of this conversation as it relates to competitive advantage. And again, if you're looking at a company that doesn't have a very strong competitive advantage, unless if you have a clear way in which you're going to quickly create a newfound competitive advantage, I would be skeptical of either buying that company or investing in that company because companies that don't have strong competitive advantages often fail. And the economic situation we're in right now that emanated from this virus that's obviously taking place in spring of 2020 will indeed be a very clear demonstration of that. Many, 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 many small businesses will go out of business in the coming months and years if they haven't gone out of business already. And by and large, most of those companies will have been companies that didn't have clear enough competitive advantage in their local marketplaces, or there'll be companies that were overextended by trying to do too much too fast. Hey, it's Jason Rogers. Thank you so much for watching the video. Be sure to subscribe, thumbs up the video, and for more, go to jasonpaulrogers.com.